Welcome to Worldview Matters, discussing controversial issues, discerning current events, defending biblical Christianity. No topic off limits. And now, here's your host, David Fiorazzo. Hey friends, God bless you. Thanks for watching and sharing the podcast. Have a special treat for you today. John Leffler is with us, formerly of Steel on Steel Radio. Great podcast for years. But I want to thank some friends who have been uh, getting a hold of us and uh, making some donations to Worldview Matters. It is tax deductible, by the way. Uh, the most recent is from Don in Nina, Wisconsin. Brother, thank you. We appreciate it. Now, there's so many on the list. I just find it interesting to go through the states that we've heard from because I've rattled off the names already. But uh, we want to shout out to Minnesota, Las Vegas, Nevada, Maryland, Ohio, California, Wyoming, New York, Washington, Georgia, Nebraska, South Dakota, South Carolina, Minnesota. Did I already say? Yes, I did. Uh, Virginia and Iowa. What surprises me is there's no Texas yet and Idaho, John Leffler. Anyway, let's bring in uh, broadcast journalist John Leffler. You can get info on him at Candlelight Christian Fellowship and his uh, email, john at steelonsteel.com. Can't wait to talk about collapsing narratives. John Leffler, welcome to Worldview Matters. Greetings. Good to be. Well, actually, I'm not back. It's the first time we've done this show, right? <laughs> yeah, so. we used, we did some uh, audio in the past where we talked, uh, solved a lot of the world's problems, and here we are continuing. Um, but let's start with, can you really, you're a watchman on the wall, at least I consider you that. Can you really retire if you're a watchman on the wall? No, uh, we did our radio show for 32 years. I've been in broadcasting since 1965. Wow. But about two thirds of it in news talk, some of it secular, a lot of it Christian narrative. And after 32 years of tracking everything, and we always dealt with the trends and got ahead of the curve. We were tried to stay six months out uh, because there's so many data points in there. And I still do that. Uh, the difference now is I'm just appearing on uh, people's radio shows when I'm asked to do it rather than doing a daily show, which, as you know, you know, people think radio is a, a glamour sport. Uh, it, it, yeah, there's a sort of a glamour side to it. But if you're going to do really good radio or podcast, there's a lot of research and effort, uh, typically eight hours to do a one or two hour show. Wow. And uh, so I finally decided, no, I need some perspective. So that's and where you, we are. You were daily too, right? Yeah, we were daily. Wow. And, uh, for a while, one time we were four to 6 p.m. drive time. We started in Denver, Colorado and had a pretty big listening audience on the front range and then it expanded to different networks and over the time you get thrown off some networks and added by other you know, it's the 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 fate of broadcast right i said you know you just get used to it and, so john uh, where can people hear some of your past radio shows or your recent videos is it on rumble candlelight christian fellowship where else right i did a, we did a couple of recent things on the middle east at candlelight christian fellowship and the, you can either go to their site, candlelight.org, or go to Rumble and search Candlelight Christian Fellowship, and there it is, a stone of stumbling. And we talked about the Middle East and how narratives are unraveling. Nar narratives are unraveling everywhere now. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to guide where we are headed in the future days as they're heading in our direction. Well, let's talk about these collapsing narratives and the response um which is fascinating. I think there's a lot of pride involved. So uh, they don't like it when narratives collapse. But I just want to toss out one to you right now. We've been hearing a lot about Christian nationalism. And mm -hmm. since January 6, a few years ago, they're trying to put uh, Christians, conservatives, uh, maybe Republicans, maybe independents, just patriotic Americans into one basket saying you're extreme. You're Christian nationalists. And now it's used in a derogatory way. Would that be one of the narratives uh, and will that collapse? That's more of a recent one. Yeah, it, uh, that one is not a narrative propping everything up. Okay. Um, and there are aspects of Christian nationalism, which I don't think we would subscribe to. Right. You know, we, right. I can't endorse that openly. But what happens when a word like that becomes weaponized is that first it starts with a pretty concise definition like racist. All right. But then as it has its impact, people go, well, gee, golly, Willikers, that's a great word. Let's spread it out. And so then the definition tends to broaden out until finally it becomes so broad that it doesn't mean anything anymore. And, and people are just basically, you know, somebody says, you're a racist. Yeah, whatever. You have anything to contribute to the conversation, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so that's the, the 
reason that is being weaponized right now is they understand that the Christian right has become a very important force, and they're keeping their troops freaked out. Mm -hmm. And you really saw this freak out during the COVID lockdowns, where, say, for example, people who had medical dispensation from wearing a mask. And please, let's not go back into that issue, right? <laughs> uh, but they'd go out to shop, and there would be people up on their faces screaming at them in terror that they were the ones responsible for, you know, uh, spreading the disease and killing babies and kids and uh, all of that. And that shows you how susceptible a very sizable part of our population is to these narratives. And so that narrative right there is it's broadening out. What they want to do is take the term white Christian nationalist and then smear it all over everything. And at Candlelight, we saw an example of that. You can still find the, the uh, uh, documentary on uh, YouTube, which was done by the Times of London, and they came in and they Try, they interviewed a bunch of people at the church and other parts of the area, and the whole issue is why so many conservatives were moving to North Idaho. And they started out by saying, oh, it's a great place. You have lakes and forests and mountains and hiking trails and bears and things like that. Uh, and then and they showed a bunch of pictures, and we have a five-star resort. And then they went, oh, but Idaho has a dark past. Okay. <laughs> And then went back to the white Aryan nation supremacist group that were here 25 years ago, but are no longer here, uh, and tried to connect our church, which is a Calvary-affiliated type of church, mm -hmm. with the white Aryan nations. And, you know, when the producer was here uh, videotaping this, I went up and talked to him, said, hi, I'm so-and-so, and blah, blah, blah. And they did interview me. Uh, and I said, are you here to do a documentary or a hit piece? <laughs> and he and he gave me that typical progressive media look, you know, it's the like that, which means they're either blank inside or they realize they've been had. And they interviewed me and they didn't use one second of the interview that I gave them because I didn't give them the juicy stuff they were looking for, mm. you know. So they came in with a narrative. They just wanted stuff to reinforce the narrative and they go back and tell lies about us. And that's what that narrative Christian nationalism is all about. Hmm. What would be one, before we get into some, uh, you sent me in an email, uh, including climate change, that's a big one we've got to talk about. Um, but what about, we've got a big election coming up this year, if there is going to be an election, I hope there is, uh, in 2024, <laughs> in November. Um, so what would be a narrative? They seem to be pointing a lot of uh, people to, to Trump and uh, versus Biden and making it about the personality rather than policy, platform, and procedure. But is there a narrative about the election or about Trump that you can share with us that might be crumbling or collapsing? No, because it's all part of silly season. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? Just a, well, uh, election is silly season in which all sorts of people say all sorts of things about their <laughs> opponents that they can't prove. Let me give you an example, the whole issue of NATO. Uh, Trump made a comment uh, when he was talking about NATO, and he told uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the head of NATO, not NATO, but the European Union, that, you know, if you guys don't fess up and start supporting your share of NATO the way you're supposed to, you get attacked, we're not going to come to your aid. Oh, my gosh, immediately. <laughs> the chattering classes just go ape doodles over the whole thing, you know. <laughs> uh, and in context, you understand what he's saying. Look, NATO is a group organization. You're not paying your fair share. You're not taking it seriously. So why should we? But they take one line out of context, and then it's hours of commentary on MSLSD, you know, and the Communist News Network and some of yeah. the other uh, unreliable channels of news. And I can speak as a professional of over five decades. I wouldn't go to them to for an honest report on news. I'd always have to corroborate it somewhere else. But so, um, go ahead. John Leffler, uh, before we go to climate change, yeah. let's talk about Gaza. Um, I haven't had you on since, you know, the, what happened last October 7th, the demonic, horrific attacks by Hamas on mm -hmm. Israel. And uh, I don't know what you mean if, as far as collapsing narrative where Gaza is concerned. So explain that. OK, well, in 1988, Hamas was founded. Uh, its purpose is the genocidal destruction of Israel. It has not changed in that, and it still swears to it to this day. And even with the head of Hamas being in hiding, he's still trying to achieve that by getting the Arab world to revolt against Israel and to attack them. 
Okay. So, uh, you know, from this, the here's the narrative. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Gaza was free. <laughs> Gaza was free. You know, uh, from 2005, the Israelis withdrew from it. They were gone. 18, 19 years, the Israelis were gone. Did Hamas do anything with Gaza? Well, first of all, Hamas was elected in 2006 as representative of that part of the Palestinian government. 2007, they revolted violently against Fatah. It was an armed war. And sure enough, all the media just sat there and go, oh, gee golly williker, gee golly williker. And from that moment on, Hamas has launched hundreds of thousands of missiles and rockets into Israel, launched incursions across the border, murdered Israelis, yada, yada, yada. Mm. And finally, it hit its peak on October 7th of last year when they killed over 1,200 people, wounded over 5,000. I forget how many women they raped, mm. blah, blah, blah. And Israel finally said, basta. I love that Italian word. You know what that means. Basta. It's enough. Stop. Okay. Enough. And, right. That's <laughs> enough. And they said, we're going to take, take these people out. That's all we're going to do. Now, as soon as that happened, the world was shocked. And just like with the Trump election, the media goes into, because it doesn't match their narrative. The narrative is the Jews came in in the beginning of the 20th century and occupied land that was owned by the Palestinians. That's not true. It's not right. historically true. That's what I did in these series, A Stone of Stumbling. The land was empty. <laughs> there were some Arab towns. There were some Yazidi villages etc. The majority population in Jerusalem was Jewish, not Arab at the time. And they came in and they bought every scrap of land they bought. But finally, when we got to 1948, they, the UN said, look, we need to partition this into a small Jewish state and the Arabs can have everything else, including generally most of, in generally Jerusalem as well, which is what they want. Uh, Israel said, please, we want to live in peace with our neighbors. Please, please, please. Let's just sign this agreement and get on with life. The Arab world said, no, they attacked Israel. They attacked again in 1967. They attacked again in 1973. Mm -hmm. And now this is the, la the next major attack. There have been a couple of others. So as soon as it happened, they, they go into this tw two, two days of obituaries, as I call them, until they figure out how they can flip it. Because the BBC, CNN, all these groups, they're notoriously anti-Israel. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to my wife at the time, watch, they're going to have to try to flip the narrative to make the heavies Israel and the victims uh, the Palestinians, the Hamas Palestinians in Gaza right now. Because they believe in the communist narrative that the West adheres to under wokus pocus, and that is there are oppressors and oppressed. And Israel has to be the oppressor. Uh, wow. And so within a couple of days, they had that rocket explode in the parking lot of the hospital. A lot of people were killed immediately, immediately, without missing a beat. The BBC was on it and CNN and the other groups were right behind them, like Queen Elizabeth's corgis after sausage. OK, and they were going, you know, Israel bombed this hospital. Look at the dead. OK, well, it turns out, of course, it was a Hamas missile that That's fell right. short. That's right. Uh, and and they should have known because over 10 to 30 percent of these missiles fail and they fall short into their own territory. Uh, but then the damage was done. And then when Israel invaded uh, and they said, well, look at all these people suffering, look at all this, look at all that. Well, guys, you brought it on yourself. Now, I, I don't want to see people suffer. I want it to be peaceful. I hate to see kids get killed in in war. It's a terrible, terrible thing. But at least see it through the eyes of what was happening there. Mm. Um, and so if you notice, the Netanyahu government uh, is determined to see this to its through, uh, end, regardless of the world. The other narratives that have collapsed among the Israeli left, the narratives of the Israeli leftist elitists have been, well, the issue is just land. And if we just come up with a treaty and give them land, and they get a government, and we get land, then everything will be okay. Gaza completely shattered that myth. The idea that the Palestinians want peace. It's been shattered. The idea that a two-state solution is wanted by anybody in Israel or the Palestinians, overwhelmingly, that's been shattered. Mm. But that's the policy that the Biden administration is pursuing, trying to hammer together a two-state solution. Well, what will guarantee your peace partner? Who, who's your peace partner here? You have Israel's on one side. They say, okay, we'll respect the, the terms of a treaty. But Hamas didn't observe those terms that were already signed in some of the agreements from Oslo. The West Bank 
You know, Fatah government hasn't done that. They've been a launching platform for terrorists into Israel ever since uh, the, the Second Intifada erupted after the collapse of the peace talks in 2001. Mm -hmm. So who is your peace partner? You have to have a stable state. So then they come in and they say, oh, okay, well, we'll provide international guarantees. Okay, well, we've already determined that whether we look at Rwanda or what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, international guarantees don't mean zilch, okay, because they write these guarantees down. But a couple of years later, when it comes time to call it due, the countries that make the guarantees go, you know, I don't know if the Brits can do this. Oh, shucky do. Uh, golly willikers, we are just so preoccupied with other things. We don't know if we want to do that, you know. Uh, and this is what happens. Uh, look at the Budapest Memorandum. Great Britain, United States, Russia, and I think France all agreed that Russia would respect the sovereignty of all of its neighboring countries after the Soviet Union fell. That's been totally shattered. Russia yeah. went into Georgia. Russia's gone into Ukraine. And that narrative is falling apart. The narrative of the yeah. right that Putin's a good guy is falling apart. Mm -hmm. He's not upholding Western Christian values. He's persecuting churches like evangelicals, Baptists, Jehovah's mm -hmm. Witnesses, Mormons, and other non-official denominations. In eastern Ukraine, they are shutting down institutions like Christian orphanages, etc. Anything that's non-Orthodox is being shut down by the Russians. You really have to look wholeheartedly at what's going on and understand that there's a lot of crossover going now, David, that's, and I predicted this as early as 2000s, that you're going to start to see weird crossovers between groups that we thought were allied or enemies, and suddenly people you thought were enemies agreeing with each other, and yeah. people you thought were friends disagree. You mean so we're, we're another... bedfellows, is that what you mean? We're bedfellows. Strange bedfellows, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, strange bedfellows, you know, <laughs> and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. But you have to look at it with what I call truth oriented eyes, mm -hmm. not narrative eyes. OK, yep. your, your narrative must der derive from the truth. Well, one of the most ridiculous, I guess, um, partnerships <laughs> yeah, would be the LGBTQ marching for Palestine, pro-Palestine. <laughs> right. This makes and no sense whatsoever. Saying from the river to the sea, which means wipe out Israel, right? If, if, right. That's what that means. But they're on college campuses. And because what you said, very is, is insightful, there's got to be a victim. There's got to be an oppressed and oppressor. So Marxism, they're all familiar with, they're all behind Marxist principles in K through 12 and now at the university level in America. Now, so you see these odd things they're marching for palestine just share your thoughts on that before we get to climate change well that's because of relativism and uh, all of wokus pocus is based on relative ideas mm. uh that come out of postmoderns which most millennials have been trained in in uh in postmodern ideas and thinking and therefore you wind up with this giant panoply of conflicting self self-contradicting ideas and that's what intersectionality is all about. Intersectionality is supposed to harmonize all of these contradictions by simply ranking whose contradiction trumps somebody else's contradiction. That's right. I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's insane, David, you know. Well, it is to you and me. <laughs> right. And it doesn't make any sense whatsoever yeah. because, um, you know, in for the situation, say, for the Uyghur Muslims um, in mm. Western China, who are being very badly persecuted, along with the Christians of China. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been thrown in concentration camps to over a million or something like this. And uh, I, I was talking to the head of the uh, the Uyghur representative government in exile, and I finally said, well, you know, you're a Muslim, and these are all Muslims. What are all the Muslim countries doing to defend these people? And he said, they're not. So the people who are defending them are the Jews and the Christians. <laughs> Go figure. So, so, yeah, it's like one of these, Go figure. You know? Yeah. So. so, John, explain to us how the climate change narrative ah. is, is collapsing. I mean, there, there's so much information for those who really want to look it up and research about what is actually happening worldwide with the climate and with the global warming. Right, right, but right. so many people just buy the talking points, they buy the narrative, they follow their favorite, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio or their favorite celebrity over there, you know, and then, they're, okay, I'm all be behind saving the planet and climate change. But uh, 
what happens, what you said earlier, is they double down. Instead of saying, okay, the, this is collapsing here, you say they double down rather than repent or admit that the policies are failing or what they're talking about is not right. true. So go ahead and share your thoughts about that. Well, this, this one is fun. Uh, <laughs> like the, the pilot who shot down Yamamoto's aircraft during World War II, I said, I'm going to follow this one down to the ground to make sure it burns in flames <laughs> because we've heard nothing nothing but garbage for the last 35 years. Oh, my goodness. Uh, now, I'm, I want to take everything. I don't care whether you think there, it, there is warming or there isn't warming, that it's man-made, that CO2 plays a role in it, blah, 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 blah. There's always a gorilla in the room that nobody ever wants to talk about. And the gorilla is, okay, big shot, like Senator or uh, Secretary Kerry, our uh, theoretically envoy to climate change who just uh, left that post. Uh, what are you going to do about it? Oh, we're going to hit net zero by uh, 2030 or 2050. And you're going to do this how? Because you need to understand the entire world's economy, by economy, I mean food, clothing, shelter, healthcare, for the world's population is driven by oil and natural gas and only secondarily by nuclear or uh, hydro, hydro is a very sustainable so source of energy, and then by a minor sense, wind and solar. What will you replace it with? Um, crickets. Yeah, crickets. We're gonna, drive electric, <laughs> we're gonna drive electric cars. Oh, really? Well now, okay, if you're gonna have millions of electric cars with all these lithium exploding batteries in them, you're going to have to use millions of watts every night, you know, ampere draw, to charge those batteries. Where will that power come from? <laughs> Since you you want to bring down the dams, you want to shut down the nuclear power plants. And Europe is discovering this now, that there is nothing we can do in the short term with the technology. There's just nothing there. Uh, and when, say, for example, President Biden finally deep six the Keystone Pipeline after 10 years of these companies jumping through hoops oh. and complying with everything, companies can't afford this, say. Uh, you know, the the green crazies, the ones who are crazy in the environmental movement are going, hooray, hooray. Well, yeah, but there were riots in Pakistan because Christian families and Muslim families were being shoved below subsistence levels by the outrageous cost of gasoline, which was driving it crazy. There's nothing we can do. Hmm. That's the collapsing narrative until we get new and alternative energies that work and are economically sustainable. And up until now, it's just all balderdash. It's all, blah, 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 you know, and Secretary Kerry, you know, uh, in an interview upon leaving his uh, post, is just wringing his hands. And by the way, he's been on the wrong side of every issue since the, the uh, Vietnam War days. Um, and he's wringing his hands. Boy, we're just not cutting back carbon. We, you can't do it. We have a fragile world economy, Dave. There's the next collapsing narrative that we can borrow ourselves into oblivion with no inflation, uh, <laughs> that we can we can do all sorts of unhealthy things in the name of social spending. But we are endangering our national security. Europe is especially endangering its national security. The prices of energy are going through the roof in Europe. They have made themselves dependent on Russia on one source. Very bad idea. That's natural gas for generating, for heat, et cetera. Uh, these are the, this is real politique. This is the real world mm. compared to the ones where we pretend those gorillas in the room uh, don't exist, you know, and they're collapsing. But we remember, we're going to pay a heavy penalty the more they keep the narrative going. Mm -hmm. And narratives keep going because people base their careers on these narratives. Yeah. The worse the tension becomes, the more damage that's done and the bigger the crash or the explosion when it finally implodes. Yeah, I just to see you and I might see some narratives collapsing and then we see so many people that just aren't willing to look at the truth or look at reality or do any research. They just still believe the talking points. We can stay on, on you know, climate change we can do a whole hour on climate change, but I want you to touch on, we've got three minutes left, John. Sorry about that. But you're yeah. a pro. Talk about immigration. Talk about the southern border. What's the collapsing narrative there? Well, the collapsing narrative is that, once again, you have national security issues. Uh, Europe's discovering it. And that's because of the fact that right now, the Teachers Association for Headmasters in France is now protesting because the Muslim population there are threatening to kill headmasters that have to discipline their kids. 
<laughs> um, they're discovering that you cannot take two populations with different worldviews and smash them together in large numbers and hope that you will, will not have problems. Part of it's not quite as bad where we have been because the people coming up from Latin America, about 80 percent, uh, share a Christian worldview coming out of European civilization. Islamic civilization and Western civ are not compatible in their current forms. There's a small group of moderate Muslims who want to see Islam reform. But that's the lesson we've learned. We're endangering national security. We have 20% of the people coming across are from other countries, mm -hmm. uh, military-age men. We yep. don't know what they're doing. Large numbers of Chinese, large numbers of Middle Easterners. Are they setting up sleeper cells in the U.S.? We don't know. Okay. Do you, do you think that's going to be a huge issue when it comes to the election in November? Yeah, I, I think that'll be a huge issue. Yeah. Uh, same thing in Europe. You're noticing that the populace is more and more not believing what the government is saying. Huh. And that's happening in Europe. The rise of the AFD party, they call it far right and blah, 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 neo-Nazi, et cetera. Uh, but despite everything that the media have said about AFD, the polls are still polling about 40% among the German populace. And the same thing is here. People, I'm not listening anymore. I, I, don't, I don't care what the people on The View say. They're, they're idiots, you know. Um, who cares what CNN says? I don't go there for news. Who cares what Rachel Maddow says? I don't care. You know, it's nothing important. It's not the real world. Exactly. Well, John, I uh, wish we had more time to catch up, but um, it's so good to reconnect with you after a while and good to see you getting back into it. If I want to lead people to Candlelight Christian Fellowship on YouTube and Rumble. If you want to watch Israel, A Stone of Stumbling with John Leffler, go look that up on YouTube and Rumble as well. There it is. And uh, John, we just appreciate all the hard work you put in for years, man. Like I said earlier, you're a glutton for punishment. 32 years. Oh, my goodness. But uh, thanks for your time, brother. No problem. God bless. Yep. God bless you. We'll hopefully connect again soon. Uh, friends, thanks for, again for sharing the podcast. That's how it's getting out there. And uh, we appreciate you. God bless you. And as always, keep speaking the truth about things that matter. <laughs>